And with that, I would like to turn it over to our presenter today, Dr. Katrina Kortz, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UNMC. Whenever you're ready. Great. Wonderful. Thank you all for um, tuning in today and listening to my presentation on sleep. This is something that I am um, very passionate about. It's um, an area of research for me, as well as a large portion of what I do clinically is, is addressing sleep problems. Um, and I'm currently housed within the University of Nebraska Medical Center um, Department of Psychiatry. Just to give you a brief outline of the things we'll be discussing today, I'm going to just really quickly go over how much sleep our kids need, what are some of the disparities that they encounter, and then what are the consequences of not getting enough sleep. We'll spend most of our time today talking about um, some of the common sleep problems that you may be encountering in clinical practice, and those are broken out by developmental stage, as well as the evidence-based treatments for those sleep problems. We'll also spend a little bit of time talking about how you can assess for sleep problems in your own clinical practice, as well as reviewing some of the resources that I commonly recommend for both providers, families, and kids. So as many of you are really well aware that um, roughly 30% of our school-age kids and 24% of our adolescents are endorsing some kind of sleep disturbance, and that could be anything from nocturnal enuresis to insomnia, um, frequent night awakenings. There's a lot of different things that can contribute to those sleep disturbances, but overall, a significant portion of your clinical population is endorsing sleep problems. And of course, we see higher rates of sleep disturbances among um, kiddos with neurodevelopmental conditions, such as ADHD and autism, as well as for our children with psychiatric diagnoses, such as depression, um, and anxiety. Very quickly, I just want to review what the recommended sleep duration guidelines are for, for our youth. This is one of my all-time favorite graphics put out by the National Sleep Foundation. I commonly recommend it to my patients. I keep it saved on my own um, personal computer because I think it's such a handy way to review what the, what the guidelines say. Um, so in the, the dark blue bars, you'll see that's the recommended amount of sleep for most, um, for most people. However, on those light blue bars above and below, you'll notice um, kind of extends the, the windows. Um, I think this is important because while um, we know that most of our um, toddlers need about 11 to 14 hours of sleep per 24 hour um, period, um, there are some that need slightly less and then also some that need slightly more. And I think that's what's really important to consider as we're assessing and talking about sleep in primary care. Um, is that all of our sleep needs are somewhat different. And so we have these guides, but um, it's also important to know that you can live outside of those um, windows as well. We can't talk about sleep without talking about what gets in the way, right? Because many of our patients and the families that we get to work with, um, they are not getting the recommended amount of sleep, both as the, both the children, youth in the home, as well as for the parents. So the first thing that I wanna call attention to is our school start times. Um, unfortunately for adolescents, um, they're going to school very, very early in the morning, and that doesn't really align with their circadian rhythm, and um, there's a natural delay that happens as part of adolescence, and so um, many of our adolescents are being asked to wake up way too early to make it to school on time, um, when they just simply can't get to bed at an early enough time to be able to get the full sleep duration that we're recommending. Some other factors include the built environment, so if there's a lot of um, traffic noise or light exposure, maybe there's um, it's a busy household and so you've got some co-sleeping or some bed sharing going on out of necessity. Um, let's think about things like extracurricular activities. So um, sport, sports and um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, church youth groups, those things that extend well into the evening, as well as for some of our adolescents who may be working a, a job or two after school, of course. And then, of course, lastly, um, our sleep health disparities, things like household chaos and lower SES status, um, parental occupation have all been linked to lower sleep duration and increased increase sleep disturbances for many of our youth. The idea here being um, specifically for household chaos that um, there may not be the structure in place to really help um, kids sleep with the best sleep possible and the most sleep possible. And then, of course, with parental occupation, thinking about what time parents are coming home um, from their various shifts and if they work different shifts, if their shifts change, their jobs change frequently, if they're working multiple jobs, then that can also get in the way of children's sleep. So now that we know some of the risk factors associated with insufficient sleep, let's talk about um, what happens when kids don't sleep enough. So what's most concerning to me is things like car accidents. Um, 
we see we tend to see higher rates of car accidents among our teenagers who are not getting enough sleep. And this is really important to consider for you and I, because many of them are on the road the same time we are headed into work, but they're headed to high school. So we've got some really sleepy teenagers that are out on the road driving these massive vehicles um, and put all of us at risk. We also know that when kids are not getting enough sleep, they're at increased risk for injury, both um, mainly unintentional accidents. So getting hurt while playing soccer or um, you know, being extra clumsy, stumbling through the halls. It's also an increased risk of um, stimulant use and caffeine use. Um, so we're actually trying to make up that sleepiness by consuming things like Red Bull and energy drinks. They're more likely to engage in risky behavior, um, like this young man flying up the down on his, on his bicycle. So just, uh, we know that adolescence is a time of increased risk taking anyway, but especially when, when adolescents are not getting enough sleep. Sleep is associated with weight gain, um, as well as mental health challenges, including suicidality, um, suicidal attempts, um, and increases in depression and anxiety. We tend to see more emotions come out, especially in our little ones not uncommon for when they're not getting enough sleep, we see these really big emotions arise. Um, this idea of emotional lability, zero to 60 and very, very quickly. And then just increased need for, for help with, with um, just kind of managing life. And again, going back to that idea of like suicidal ideation. So increased risk for suicidal ideation, self-harm behavior when adolescents are not getting enough. Before we jump in and start talking about um, some of the different sleep problems and interventions by age group, I want to hit this first. I want to talk about sleep hygiene and bedtime routines because this works for everybody, starting in infancy all the way through um, adults, such as ourselves. And so this is really your, your first line intervention, the thing that you can be doing um, in primary care to help offset and potentially prevent sleep problems in, in the patients and the families that you work with. First of all, it's incredibly important that we set and maintain regular bedtimes and wake times. This includes weekdays and weekends. So um, your bedtime and your wake time really should not vary from day to day, seven days a week. It really should be pretty consistent. And this is true for, again, infants, children, youth, and adolescents. We also need to identify what an age appropriate bedtime routine is. Um, so that for our little ones might include um, reading a book before bed, getting snuggles from mom and dad, um, but really, what's most important for all of us is that we um, dim those lights about an hour to two before going to bed, um, because that allows our melatonin production to be, to be to fully do its job. And then, of course, doing things like brushing our teeth and putting on PJs, um, but this can all be part of a you know, developmentally appropriate bedtime routine for most of us. And really what that does is it helps prepare our mind for falling asleep. It sends a message to our brain and gets that melatonin working and says, hey, it's about time to go to bed. So if I follow this in the same order every night, then there's some predictability and it allows me to get the most out of my sleep when I finally lay my head down on the pillow. Maybe we'll think about avoiding any stimulating play or electronics one hour before bed. Um, so for our little ones, you know, we want to avoid roughhousing and, and watching TV for us as adults. That means that electronics don't belong in the bedroom, which I know many of you have heard before, but it, it, it is a challenge facing many of our um, and tweens and adolescents these days having their phones in their rooms. So really, really important that um, cell phones are getting stored outside of the room and that TVs are being kept off and really preferably that there aren't TVs in the bedroom for our little ones. You want to be thinking about having a, a dark and a quiet sleep environment. Um, so making sure that there's blackout curtains over the blinds, um, that there are hallway lights on. If uh, little ones need a nightlight, that's okay, but want to make sure that it's not so bright and it's positioned in a place in the room that's not going to be flashing directly in their eyes. Quiet. The reason I even asked for knife to this is um, thinking about some of those uh, sleep disparities that we briefly spoke about. It's not always possible for a home environment to be quiet, and so um, and not everybody sleeps well when it's dead silent. So thinking about noise machines, having the fan on, or even some quiet music can go a long way for helping some of our little ones sleep. We do want to make sure that the child falls asleep in their own bed each night. Um, we we'll want to be mindful of any cultural factors that may be at play here. Certainly it's appropriate within some cultures or um, part of the, the cultural norms to do close sleeping. So if that's part of the family's um, concern, we want to make sure that we're addressing that in a culturally sensitive way. And then again, for our, our 
teenagers especially, we want to make sure that we're eliminating caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol in the evening. I mean, in general, just all together, of course, but um, especially in the evening because those all differentially impact the quality of sleep that you can get. Next. I'm going to jump in and talk about some of the different sleep problems and interventions, um, specifically by age group, um, depending on who's coming in the day. These are some of the things that you might see. Now, to be clear, this is not a comprehensive list of the sleep problems. I tried to pick and choose the things that I um, am commonly consulted about by, by my pediatrician colleagues and primary care physicians, um, and the things that tend to be the most prevalent. So just to give you a sense of some of the things that uh, might come up in your clinic if you're going through these things already. In our infants in our early childhood age range, one of the most um, Prevalent concerns is the difficulty settling to sleep, and this can include both bedtime and time. So, the idea of um, being able to fall asleep and initiate sleep independently um, is a big part of this, and that is again both at night and you know during nap times during the night. The other thing that you might see are these frequent awakenings. So, waking up at the night during the night or during a nap, and not then being able to fall back asleep. So, resulting in crying or screaming, yelling for mom and dad. Um, in the middle of the night. And then another common sleep problem, of course, in this age range is this idea of the transition from the crib to the toddler bed. Um, very challenging for many families to navigate because now all of a sudden this little toddler has a whole new sense of independence and um, now all of a sudden just crawl, about, crawl out of bed very easily and run to the door and go find mom and dad there. So these are pretty common sleep problems that you may encounter in your clinical practice. One of the most common culprits, though, for all three of these issues is this idea of having a parent present when the child initiates sleep on. This creates a problem because the child learns that when they fall asleep, mom and dad is always, mom or dad are there with me to either put my back, um, to feed me, to rock me, just to be that you know, calming parental presence. And so then when I wake up in the middle of the night, I actually can't self soothe and put myself back to sleep because I need mom or dad to be there to help me with that. The sleep onset associations are really one of the most major drivers for most of the sleep problems that we see in infancy and early childhood. So the um, number one first line recommendation for these early childhood sleep problems is really this early intervention or prevention. And you all are so well positioned in your practices to be able to deliver this. The little asterisk next to asterisk next to the early intervention prevention is because this is a well-established treatment, meaning that it is under it has been rigorously studied by numerous research teams and evaluated to have incredible evidence for its efficacy. So what this entails in these little ones is really um, just a, a parent consultation session. Um, there's some research to suggest that even one single 45-minute parent consultation session can yield an additional 1.3 hours more sleep per night, which I know many of our parents and families would be delighted to receive. If you add this up over time, it means that they could be getting at least nine hours more uh, sleep per night or per week, which is, which is really a huge amount. The focus of this intervention is on establishing healthy sleep routines from the start. So even in infancy, setting up a bedtime routine, what's the sleep schedule look like for the child? Is it predictable? Is it consistent? What are the sleep associations that you may be inadvertently creating? Things like having um, a parent feed the infant and then put them to bed when they're when they fell asleep when they're feeding that's going to be one of those problematic sleep associations because it really is then dependent on the parent for the child to be able to fall asleep and that's what we're trying to prevent so um this psychoeducation education from the beginning is so important and a big part of this not surprisingly is this idea of drowsy but awake so infants and, and little ones should be put to sleep when they're should be put into bed excuse me when they're drowsy, when they're tired, but they're not yet asleep. And this is so important for that self-soothing process so that they learn to initiate sleep independently. Also helps with those nighttime awakenings because when they do wake up in the middle of the night, they're much more likely to roll over, grab their, their stuffy if they're little, and then be able to put themselves back to sleep. And of course, when we're thinking about our infants, we also want to be talking about the, the safest ways for babies to sleep. So thinking about making sure they're placed on their back, if there's not a ton of stuff in their crib, there really shouldn't be anything in their crib other than a firm, flat mattress. And also this idea that they should be going to sleep in their own space um, because we do see higher rates um, of infant mortality among um, those things. But again, always want to be sensitive to any cultural considerations that the family may present with. 
In addition to early prevention and intervention, um, the next set of in interventions um, includes sleep training. Uh, again, it has an abstract because it's um, a well-established intervention. It's been tested time and again and shown to be efficacious. Um, other terms for this you may have heard include the cry it out, the verb method, systematic ignoring, unmodified extinction if you want to go the psychology route. Um, but really the idea here is that you're going to implement a really healthy, safe sleep routine for your infant or your child. And then once they're put down, drowsy but awake, you're going to refrain from providing any attention to the child. That means they may scream, they may cry, they may call out your name, depending on how old they are, but you're not going to intervene. You're not going to give them any attention. All of this, I said it does work incredibly quickly, like in under a week right, for most kids. And so um, it's, it's a painful week, but you can really have the sleep training done relatively quickly and um, families can be on their way. The con, unfortunately, is this idea of um, parental acceptance or feasibility. It is incredibly hard to listen to your child scream and cry and maybe even call out your name um, and, and be distressed for so long. And so for many families, um, it's just not something that they're able, they're not able to do. And um, having an honest conversation with them in the beginning is, is so important um, because this is one of those interventions where if the family isn't able to carry it out, it does make um, some of the other interventions um, it just make them take a little bit longer or it can. So we want to be really clear and upfront with families about what, what the, the risks are um, and talking this through with them to make sure that you're setting them up for success, essentially. Another um, uh, one of the interventions that's perhaps a little bit more palatable to families is this idea of graduated extinction. And so similar to um, the cry it out method, you are going to implement a um, safe and developmentally appropriate bedtime routine where you put the child to bed um, drowsy but awake. Um, instead of just allowing them to cry in the room or um, be distressed, the parents are going to go in and do these brief, these brief planned checks. Checks would really only last no more than a minute. Um, and maybe that's for parent peace of mind that the child is okay, that they're not um, in any kind of harm or danger. And over time, the checks are gradually faded until the child is able to initiate and sustain um, sleep independently. Um, it's so important when we do this graduated extinction though that um, parents aren't providing any verbal or physical attention to their child. So, um, they're really just going in and doing like an eyes on check to make sure the child is okay, but they're not singing to them, they're not consoling them, they're not playing their um, The part of this intervention is that it is very family friendly. It's much more, like I said, palatable to, to parents um, because they do get to see eyes on and, and maybe provide some um, just their soothing presence, might help calm the child. But the downside is that it can take longer because when you go in and do these planned checks you may actually be reinforcing a child's crying. And so while it is effective, um, it does take a bit more time to implement. Um, so now as we tra transition to kind of our school age kiddos, some of the sleep problems you may encounter. Um, among my favorite are the, is the bedtime stalling, the curtain calls, the protests, um, bedtime resistance. So not wanting to go to sleep. So many, many kids' bedtime is like a 10-hour time out, right? It's a time when they're not allowed to play, they're not allowed to talk to you, they're not supposed to be interacting with their siblings, and um, it's pretty boring. So it's a very different take on it than you and I have as adults, where we think of sleep as this wonderful time, potentially, where we get to relax and de-stress, and many of us aren't getting enough sleep as is anyway. But for kids, it's sometimes helpful to think about it as this 10-hour time out. So the bedtime selling and code calls then seem to make a bit more sense. We also tend to see um, a rise in nightmares and night terrors during this time, where we can see a rise in those things, as well as potentially the emergence of like nocturnal and your recess becomes an appropriate thing to consider. So we're talking about these bedtime stalling curtain calls and protests. Um, this is when parents are reporting to you that it takes at least one to two hours, if not longer, um, to put the child to bed. And it might include the dawdling or the tantrums before bed, so refusing to go to bed, um, coming up with all kinds of things that they need to do instead. I gotta go get something out of the backpack. Um, I need to say goodnight to Fido. Um, but then once they're in bed, then you may also notice an increase in the, the curtain calls, I like to call them. So needing one more hug, mom, I need one more kiss. Dad, I need a glass of water, I'm still thirsty. I need to go to the bathroom. 
So coming up with all of these um, little strategies creatively to find their way out of them and prevent sleep onset. Ultimately, these bedtime stalls may or may not um, end when the child falls asleep independently. So for many parents, they say, well, it took a few hours, but eventually little Susie was able to fall asleep by herself after me putting her back in bed repeatedly. Um, but other parents may not feel so successful. They feel like they've got to end up sitting in the room and patting the back or reading 10 more stories before the child is able to fall asleep. And of course, then that's creating these sleep onset associations that are not going to grow independent sleep in the future. And that's a big problem. So then in terms of like nightmares, um, we do tend to see these are very prevalent among our little ones. Um, but of course we tend to see higher rates or more recurrent nightmares among children with trauma or severe stress. So that might be a cue to you if, if a family is reporting these recurrent ongoing nightmares um, that there might be something else going on in the girl's head. Um, the important note about nightmares versus night terrors is that they do typically occur um, later in the night. And oftentimes kids will seek parental reassurance. They will need parents help falling down and then potentially even reinitiating sleep. So the, the kiddo is pretty actively involved when a nightmare occurs. Kids also tend to have a, a memory for the nightmare um, the next morning or the next day, which then sometimes can lead to some bedtime anxiety um, when you're preparing a child for sleep and, and the subsequent nights about um, worried that they're gonna have a bad dream again. Unlike nightmares, um, night terrors tend to occur typically in the first third of the night. Um, and this is when a child may sit up and scream, they might be a bit panic. There might even be some pretty prominent motor activity, meaning they might try and flee their room or the house even. Um, what's important to note here though, is that um, it's gonna wake up the parents. Um, the parents are gonna, are gonna hear the child screaming or attempting to leave the room but the child is really gonna be unresponsive and really will have no memory for this. And that's the one of the distinguishing features between nightmares and, and sleep terrors or night terrors. Um, and so while it's really distressing for the parent or for the caregiver, the, the child doesn't have much memory. So we tend to see these more kind of clustered in the uh, toddler um, early school age and they should fade over time. And then the last, uh, sleep problem that we'll talk about for our school age kiddos is this idea of nocturnal enuresis. Um, what's really important here is that this diagnosis actually can't be made typically until after age six years of age because that's um, developmentally when we would expect the prolonged bladder control. And diagnostically, to make a diagnosis of this, we need to see um, this involuntary urination that occurs during sleep at least twice a week for greater than three months. Um, so that's a, a pretty long period of bedwetting, essentially. The research suggests that this does affect about 10% of six-year-olds, and there does seem to be a higher prevalence among males, children with ADHD, sickle cell disease, and then those with sleep disordered breathing. So um, those are some of the kids in your, in your clinical populations that you may see um, present with nocturnal aneurysis. So thinking about some of the interventions for some of our, our school age kids, my first and, and primary intervention for most families that I work with, of course, depending on the presenting concern is this idea of the bedtime pass. It's really, um, anecdotally, it's one of the interventions that I have the most success with in my own um, clinical practice and population. Um, the bedtime passes can be implemented in kids as young as three on up to, I've done it with um, 11 and 12 year olds. So it covers a pretty wide range. But there's a couple different variations of the bedtime pass, but the idea is that the child who is actively involved in this process is given um, either one or two or three bedtime passes that can be exchanged for a quick trip out of the room. So this is for those curtain calls uh, saying, I need one more hug or I need one more kiss. Uh, I need a drink of water. I need to go to the bathroom, whatever it may be. But they um, get to turn in their pass and um, get a get out of jail free card. Um, and then once all, all the passes are gone, then the parents do what's called the robot return. So um, if you sell your passes and they say nothing fun happens after dark, it's time to go back to bed. Um, typically though, in my experience, uh, we don't even make it, to, most kids don't even make it to that third pass because that, that third pass is 
um, sufficient for getting their needs met and, and for calming their anxieties and, and helping them drift off to sleep. Um, but what's cool about this is that if we make it to the morning with any classes left over, those get to be exchanged then for um, some kind of special reward or privilege um, at the beginning of the morning from parents. So uh, what I really like about this intervention is that it's very family friendly. Um, for parents, it, it puts a limit on how many of those curtain calls can happen, but for kids, they have some control over um, being able to get out of bed. And we know that anytime we can give kids just a little bit of control or say or choice, um, it tends to go over really well. The big thing here though, the, kind of the nuance or loophole things that I always like to highlight is that um, it's really important that we have a, a consistent bedtime routine that involves things like a drink of water, going to the bathroom, um, kissing mom and dad and Fido goodnight. So that way we're minimizing the uh, number of classes that are used for those types of activities. Also, um, it's just important, I think, not to penalize a kiddo for getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. So for instance, if um, the child is laying in bed saying, I have to go to the bathroom, I have to go to the bathroom, and they want to exchange a pass to go to the bathroom with parental support, they can. But if a child very appropriately just gets up, goes to the bathroom, and then goes right back to bed, that actually does not get charged to pass, just simply because that's ultimately what we want from the child. We want to see them get up and do that. I do always encourage parents to keep a close eye on the little ones when they are um, going to the bathroom quietly in the middle of the night um, when they should be in bed, just to make sure that they're not getting into anything or, or finding those bathtub toys to play with instead of actually reinitiating sleep. So that's the bedtime pass. Um, another very effective strategy is this idea of positive routines. Um, so first of all, we do a, a two-week sleep diary to determine what is a child's bedtime on average, and what time are they actually falling asleep most nights? And the bedtime is then faded to match their typical sleep onset time. So let's say you're putting your, bed, your child to bed at eight, but they're really not falling asleep until nine o'clock. You're gonna fade their bedtime back until nine o'clock, which allows that buildup of homeostatic sleep pressure and um, more closely aligns with their, their sleep schedule as is. And then in that time before bed, we're gonna implement this chain of four to seven really enjoyable and relaxing pre-sleep activities. Of course, activities that don't involve electronics or stimulating play, but things that are gonna help get them um, ready for bed. So maybe this is reading a few books with mom or dad, doing some progressive muscle relaxation, um, doing some coloring, some art, something that's quiet and calming, and all things that the child should enjoy. And once they're able to fall asleep quickly, so you're putting them in bed at nine and they're falling asleep for 9, 10, 9, 15, then you can actually think about um, fading the bedtime earlier so that it more closely aligns with the family's values and sleep schedule, their desired sleep schedule. So a bit more about um, bedtime fading um, because this is actually a, a common component of a lot of the inter interventions that I deliver. So think about bedtime passes or the positive routines. Um, anytime that I, I work with a family that's struggling with um, involved in the bedtime resistance, bedtime feeding can be a really helpful little adjunctive um, treatment in addition to the other recommendations that I'm making. And again, this is the idea that um, you're going to assess the, the current sleep schedule using that sleep diary over two weeks. Um, and it's really important because um, you, you bother so much information. You can't change what you can't track or measure, right? So um, Parent may be saying it takes it, it takes them three hours to fall asleep, but in reality, it's only taking about an hour, which can feel like three hours naturally if you're constantly getting up and redirecting your child back to bed. But having a really good understanding over time of when your child is likely falling asleep um, helps us implement the most effective bedtime feeding protocol. Um, so once we have that two-week sleep diary filled out, then we want to determine the bedtime based on when the child is likely to fall asleep within 15 minutes. 15 minutes in, in the sleep world is kind of a magic number. If you're falling asleep in under five minutes, then that means you're probably not getting enough sleep or you're really tired. Um, and if it's taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep, then that means that we've maybe got a um, misalignment going on. So 15 minutes is kind of what we're shooting for on average. So over time, again, we'll set the bedtime earlier um, after we've had some successful nights falling asleep. So typically within my clinic, I recommend um, if we start the bedtime at, at nine and the kiddo is able to 
um, fall asleep within 15 minutes for two to three nights in a row, then we can talk about moving it forward gradually in 15 minute increments until we get to the desired bedtime. So the really critical part of this, um, going back to you know, how sleep works and the physiology of sleep, is that um, we really need to avoid sleeping outside of prescribed times. Now, um, honestly, we're talking about our toddlers who may still be needing naps, but for some for other little ones. So um, this comes back to the idea of a consistent bedtime and wake time. Um, if we're taking naps during the day or allowing our children to oversleep when we're trying to implement these sleep interventions, such as bedtime feeding, and it's actually popping their sleep pressure and disrupting their, um, their homeostatic sleep drive, which then makes it very, very challenging to implement these interventions. And so there is an element of this that does often require that the child is um, somewhat sleepy during the day. And while that can make for um, a long day or a long couple days, it's really what's going to give you the, the power and pressure to, to build up and allow these interventions to work over time. And then lastly, for our school age kids thinking about um, some of our, our interventions, um, we, uh, one of the, the, the best um, interventions that we have for nocturnal enuresis is this idea of dry bed training with a urine alarm. And again, you see that matrix there because it is a um, well-established intervention for addressing nocturnal enuresis. Um, but I'm always amazed at how many families have gotten to me and they've been struggling with nocturnal enuresis for years and have no idea what the urine alarm was or what dry bed training was. And so for many of them, they're very relieved because it's very effective, but also kind of frustrated too that um, it took so long to, to get to this point. So just to give you a sense of what the urine alarm is, you can see this picture here. Really, it's a um, alarm unit where the sensor is placed in the, in the child's underwear and it is moisture sensitive. And then there's a cord that runs and that takes just to the top of the child's pajamas. Um, at the first sign of wetness, so seemingly when a, when a child is um, wetting the bed, the sensor and the alarm go off and create a very loud noise that tends to work up, wake up um, parent and the child, which then um, trains the child ultimately over time for their bladder to contract so that they can finish urinating in the toilet. Um, now, what's important, the urine alarm in and of itself is an effective intervention. However, there's also some other um, components that can make it more effective, and that's this dry bed training um, approach. Really, what that entails is um, doing lots of positive practice, so actually waking the child and having them urinate in the toilet successfully, making sure that uh, bladder evacuation is a routine part of the bedtime routine, and then also this cleanliness training. So when an accident occurs, we want to actually make sure that the child is wide awake um, and actually assist with changing their underwear, changing their pajamas, and changing their sheets. The child is a very active um, participant in this whole process. For many families, it's not uncommon for um, when there's a wedding accident for the parent to come in and handle all of it on their own. Um, but unfortunately, that does not allow the child to fully learn um, you know, the, the steps and experience and the consequences of having an accident. So it's really important to remember, though, that um, the child is, that the, these interventions are delivered in a neutral manner. It's not um, to place blame on the child or to um, shame them in any way, but it is important that they assist actually with the cleanup process, and that is part of the dry bed training that's involved. So with the dry bed training and urine alarm combination, we tend to see a 75% cure rate, which includes complete cessation of, waiting, of wetting in less than four weeks. So really, Pretty incredible intervention um, with um, tremendous outcomes. Um, just some kind of considerations, things to think about with the urine alarm. Um, they've come a long way. There's a lot of different models that are available and they get really fancy. Um, but uh, for, for some of my kids with trauma, um, their parents are understandably worried about this idea of a loud noise that might you know, jar them awake. Um, um, just because of their history. And so sometimes I'll steer them towards a model where they can choose the type of sound that goes off. Um, maybe some of the models do allow that. And then some actually have like a vibration as well as a, a sound for our really heavy sleepers who need both, um, both the noise and the, the vibrating ability too. So let's see, jump in and think about some of our adolescents um, and some of the sleep problems that they encounter. 
the one of the major complaints or concerns is, of course, insomnia. And then this um, idea of a delayed sleep wake phase disorder, too. So start with insomnia. About 20 to 30 percent of our teens um, endorse some difficulty falling asleep um, or struggling with waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep. What's important to know about insomnia is that it can be influenced both by intrinsic um, factors, such as like their circadian preference. We know that um, preference towards being a night owl or a morning lark is actually established pretty well in um, uh, early school age years, but of course with puberty onset, um, we tend to see a shift in circadian rhythm and in adolescence, so those things can matter, as well as extrinsic factors, so things like emotional distress or um, their, um, you know, limiting their involvement in their child's bedtime routine. So allowing things like TVs to stay on in the bedroom, not collecting cell phones, um, as well as things like work schedules too, of course, can get in the way. And then another common um, sleep problem that you may see in adolescents is this delayed sleep wake phase disorder. And it does affect about 16% of adolescents and young adults. And really it comes down to this inability to um, align the internal circadian rhythms to the environment. Um, so not being able to fall asleep at what we would call a, a normal time. And really this extends beyond having a preference towards being a night owl or evenness. It's um, an extension or a, a kind of an exacerbation of What's really important to know about this and, and helps us distinguish between this and insomnia is that these adolescents have no problem um, staying asleep once they are asleep. And if their sleep schedule is um, aligned with their preferred sleep schedule, like let's say over spring break or over the summer, um, then, then it's not an issue for them. So it really comes down to kind of the society, societally driven sleep schedule and telling them when they've got to wake up for, for school or for work and um, this misalignment in their own circadian rhythm. So that's the important distinguishing feature of um, insomnia versus delayed sleep wake phase disorders. If, if they are allowed to align their schedule, um, then they will sleep just fine. So thinking about interventions for um, insomnia specifically, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this um, with cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. It is a well-established intervention for insomnia, both for adolescents and for adults. It's one of the best that we have out there. The first step um, really in all sleep interventions, I believe is psychoeducation. So important for families to understand how sleep processes work, including the circadian rhythm, homeostatic sleep pressure. Um, so that way they're getting the most out of these interventions when they understand the foundation of how sleep works in the body. So no different from CBTI, we want to spend um, a good part of the intervention focusing on psychoeducation. So things like pre uh, predisposing factors, um, if there's a family history of sleep problems or if the child has anxiety or depression, then it's going to put them at greater risk for having insomnia. Might also be some precipitating factors that um, um, I'll lay the groundwork for insomnia, including major life events. If there's a divorce or a death of a family member, or maybe this is a really stressful time at school because finals week is coming up, or I've got the ACT. And then the perpetuating factors are the things that maintain it over time. Um, during these um, stressful life events, we may see that teens um, are more likely to take a nap because they're just so tired and they just need to get through the day, or they may even extend their time in bed um, because. I wasn't able to fall asleep until 1 a.m. and so I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna oversleep in the morning or maybe I'm gonna try and go to bed even earlier to see if I can get myself to fall asleep which we know is not going to be successful most often um, but there may also then be some anxiety about not being able to fall asleep one of the things that I have to say is that sleep is behavioral and we have a lot of control over how long we sleep and how well we sleep um, but unfortunately there's nothing that we can do to force or make ourselves to fall asleep so um, that can be incredibly frustrating when you're lying, lying in bed and you're, you're feeling tired, but you just can't sleep, you can't shut your brain off. Um, and so that's one of the inherent challenges of doing sleep work is that we can't make anybody sleep. And it's so important for our adolescents and for our kiddos that are struggling with insomnia. Once we've done really good psychoeducation, we want to um, do what we call stimulus control therapy. Um, basically what this comes down to is that 
oftentimes in the case of insomnia, the bed and the bedroom um, have been conditioned to create some kind of arousal, meaning racing thoughts or anxiety around sleeping. So teens will commonly describe, I was feeling really tired. I was sitting on the couch and I felt like I was ready to go to bed. Um, but then as soon as I walked into room, my room, all of a sudden I just had these racing thoughts and I just started thinking about how I'm not going to be able to fall asleep or what happens if I can't sleep because I know I've got a big test tomorrow. Um, and so a big part of um, some of those control therapy is this idea that we've got to recondition the bedroom and the bed to be conducive to sleep-inducing thoughts, essentially. So this really comes down to nothing in bed but sleep. So no TV watching, no lounging in bed, no texting, no FaceTiming, um, no reading, no homework, nothing like that. Nothing in the bedroom or nothing in the bed but sleep. And that's really challenging for many of our teens because their bed is where is their home base sometimes. And so before um, they experience any struggles with insomnia, this, it may have been very common for them to watch TV in bed or hang out and talk to their friends. Um, but unfortunately, when we've entered the, the land of insomnia, it really needs to be very limited on in how we use them. Um, it also means that uh, if they're not able to fall asleep, then they do need to get out of bed and go do something else incredibly boring. So let's say we, we set a consistent bedtime and awake time, um, and then they can't fall asleep within 20 or 30 minutes, and we have them get out of bed and go do something else, something really boring. And that gets back to the idea of when you're laying in bed and you're having all these racing and unhelpful thoughts about uh, not being able to fall asleep, we don't want you to be having those thoughts while you're already in your bed. So getting out of bed is really important. The next component of CBTI is sleep restriction therapy, um, which really, um, the, the mechanism here is that we want to build up the adolescent's homeostatic sleep pressure, which allows them to facilitate sleep. Essentially what we're, do, we're doing is inducing mild sleep deprivation. Um, and this is a part that is uh, incredibly challenging and hard for many adolescents to follow through with, but it's so, so important. So um, naps are gonna be, um, are, are going to be um, taken off the, the to-do list um, because we need that homeostatic sleep pressure to build and naps are only going to pop that sleep pressure and prevent them from being able to fall asleep at night. Um, also means consistent bedtimes and wake times, even on the weekends. Um, and so even if you, know, you didn't fall asleep until 2 a.m., if we've set your designated wake-up time as 7 a.m., then you still have to wake up and get out of bed at 7 a.m. just to keep your body um, on that schedule, even if it means that you're going to be really tired during the day. And so this is a hard one for many, many of my patients um, who are used to taking multiple naps, believe it or not. They get home from school at 3, 3.30, they take an hour-long nap, they wake up for dinner, um, maybe they do a little bit of homework, they take another nap, and then they go back to sleep somewhere between 2 and 3 a.m. Um, but you can imagine cutting out these naps is really very challenging for many of them. And then the last component of CBTI is this, um, is the cognitive restructuring. So addressing any dysfunctional beliefs about sleep. So this, the, the racing thoughts that happen when you're in the bedroom, this idea I'm never going to be able to sleep, sleep is never going to get better, I'm always going to have a hard time falling asleep, um, the tossing and turning. It's really important that we, that we address those two because ultimately those unhelpful thoughts are not going to um, allow the adolescent to initiate sleep. Um, successfully those are addressed. As we're thinking about a uh, delayed sleep wake phase disorder, um, the first step um, really in this whole process is neg negotiating the sleep schedule. And this is an important conversation for parents and teens to be having together. Um, we need to do a two week sleep diary as with everything that's kind of our, our starting point to determine what time is the child getting in bed, what time are they actually falling asleep, and then what time do they need to be up in order to be at school or to be at work. For some of the severe cases, we actually start to think about implementing like a 504 or an IEP um, to uh, adjust their school start times. Um, because when it is, is really severe, sometimes we're asking adolescents to get up in the middle of a, a sleep cycle and they're not gonna be able to engage at school anyway. Once this sleep schedule is negotiated, then it's really up to the adolescent and the parent to make sure that their adolescent is going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, even on the weekends, um, to help get their sleep back on track. 
Um, and of course, it's easier if everybody's part of that conversation, helping negotiate what that schedule looks like. The next thing that's commonly recommended is um, bright light therapy. So um, you can, now on Amazon, you can get these 10,000 lux light boxes, um, very, very inexpensively, less than $50. Um, and that becomes an important part of the adolescent's morning routine. So spending about 30 minutes per day with the, in front of the light box. This should have been first thing in the morning. This is an important part of resetting that circadian rhythm and helping them get back on track. So that means if the adolescent oversleeps by 30 minutes or if they forget, they decide to skip it and they don't do it that day. So the timing of this is really essential um, because if, you, if, if done incorrectly, it can ultimately cause more problems with sleep. So 10,000 lux, we don't want them staring directly into it, um, but it could be positioned like behind their computer monitor or while eating breakfast, um, just to prevent eye strain or um, headaches. Um, and then the last part of this um, kind of delayed sleep-wake phase approach, the first section of it at least, is bedtime feeding. So with all these strategies in place, as they experience more success falling asleep quickly, then we're gonna start to gradually move their, their bedtime up Again, about 15 minutes at a time for two to three dates in a row. If they're falling asleep successfully, then we can continue to move forward until we reach the point to them. They, the desired by time, essentially. The last thing on here um, is chronotherapy. I'm mentioning this because it is highly effective, but it is also um, probably the least preferred method for most of the teenagers and families that I work with because it's pretty intensive. Really what chronotherapy is, is it involves um, moving the bedtime and the wake time later by a few hours each day. Um, and after about one week, then the child will be at their target bedtime and wake time. And this really operates on the idea that um, for many of our teenagers struggling with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, that um, their circadian rhythm is more than 24 hours, especially during um, puberty and adolescence. And so um, we're gonna take advantage of that and actually fade them forward rather than trying to fade them back um, in bedtime. Um, again, it, it works in about a week, so it's um, very time limited and can be very efficacious, but the problem is it often does require um, a parent to, to do with them because um, as you're feeding forward, you, know, you may have them going to bed at 6 a.m. and then waking up um, at 2 p.m. and then getting forward, and so it, having that parental accountability and someone to sit with them to make sure they're able to adhere to it is really, really important. Um, in my you know, clinical care, I've had maybe two or three adolescents be able to do this successfully. Um, and usually I have very clear conversations with them about how difficult this can be and, and for their families. And it's best done over like a spring break or winter break, something where the adolescent is gonna be out of school because it does actually require them to be um, for at least a few days sleeping during the day. Um, when they should be potentially in school or working. Okay, and then just briefly want to touch on a few pharmacological treatments, as I know um, these are also questions that you likely encounter in your clinical practice. Um, the first thing, melatonin. Um, this has really taken our world by storm recently. Um, I'm amazed at the range of products that are offered now. Um, and actually a little bit concerned seeing that like cough syrup is now um, being offered with melatonin or these um, wellness drinks with melatonin in them. Um, so what, do we, what, what the research says about um, melatonin is that it is recommended for use with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder um, individuals, both adults and in adolescents and kids. Um, but the, Amer the Academy of Sleep Medicine actually does not recommend the use of melatonin for insomnia, both for sleep onset or maintenance in adults. Although there's some research to suggest that sleep onset latency can be reduced by as much as 22 minutes, meaning people are falling asleep 22 minutes earlier, but the quality of the evidence is incredibly poor at this time, especially in our, our little ones. Um, where you see the most researchers actually in kiddos with neurodevelopmental conditions, and there is some indication that melatonin can be helpful in those little ones. Um, but again, the, the quality of evidence is we still have a long ways to go. What the American Academy of Pediatrics will recommend is that um, it's used very short term um, to help with sleep onset associations in very low doses. So about 0.5 to um, one milligram, 60 to 90 minutes before bed, no more than that. And um, imagine much like uh, you all, I'm seeing adolescents come in and even kids for that matter on 10 or 15 milligrams of melatonin and the families are just feeling very frustrated because they're not 
paying it worth anymore. And again, this is where I think the psychoeducation is incredibly important um, because if we don't understand the role of light and melatonin production, then they're continuing to break, like to have really poor sleep hygiene, which is really interfering with the melatonin's ability to do its job anyway. Um, in the United States, melatonin is considered a supplement um, and it's not regulated. <laughs> uh, and that, that can actually create a problem because what we know about melatonin is it tends not to be very stable in supplements. And so the preparation itself can be incredibly variable. Um, we know that supplements vary widely by form and brand, but then even within lot, um, there can be tremendous variation. So um, one research, research study found that the um, amount of melatonin in the product itself ranged anywhere from negative 83 to 478% of the content on the label. And what's most concerning perhaps is that they found the largest variability in small doses and in the chewable products, which of course are the things that we're giving our little ones, right? Um, the other thing that I find concerning, especially being in um, a psychiatry clinic where many of my kiddos are on SSRIs, is that they found serotonin in about 26% of the samples, um, which if the family is unaware and they're also taking SSRI, um, I just have concerns about obviously um, risk of overdose, even in these low levels. So um, if you're going to be recommending melatonin, typically the, the best course of action that you have is to use the USP verified melatonin brand. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a ton of options, and, um, but this is, this is generally what's recommended, at least for right now. Um, so Nature Made has a couple, and then Natural has this um, Fast Dissolve tablet, as well as a Time Release tablet. But what you'll notice here is that, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, we want to be starting with the lowest possible dose for the shortest amount of time, especially, especially, especially in our littles. And all of these USP verified um, brands are three and five milligrams. So it's actually higher than what American Academy of Pediatrics would be recommending. So uh, I mentioned this just because I know um, we get a lot of questions about melatonin and, and you all likely do as well. And so I just want families to be aware. And also <laughs> if they try one brand and it doesn't work well, then maybe we need to try a different one. And that probably speaks to the variability in the lots and the brands, unfortunately, but also to use cautiously. Okay, and then lastly, just because we're short, a little bit short on time, kind of blow through this, but um, another question I commonly get is desmopressin for nocturnal enuresis. Um, what the research suggests is that there's about a 40% response rate. Um, and there is actually some additional evidence that it, when it's used with, in combination with the urine alarm, that it in, increases the efficacy of those interventions. Um, one of the pros of desmopressin, of course, is that it does work quickly. It's a medication, so it's ingested. Um, and families tend to see outcomes, which is, is nice, especially if you've got a family camping trip coming up or um, overnight stay at a, at a camp or something. And we really need to address this much more quickly than the urine alarm. That, that is definitely a benefit. But unfortunately, um, because we're not focusing on, on actually training the bladder uh, and increasing that body awareness, uh, there's a high rate of relapse uh, once the desmopressin is discontinued. So um, in one of the studies, they define that as greater than four or more uh, wet nights in two weeks post-intervention, meaning once the desmopressin was withdrawn. Okay. Um, and just for the sake of time, I want to show you um, a, a quick screening tool that you all can use in your own clinic practice. It's called the BEARS, um, appropriately, appropriately named for, for pediatric kiddos. Um, this is, is a, a wonderful screening tool put out by Owens and Dalzal. You can easily find it online, just a quick Google search. Um, and the B stands for bedtime problems. And so it's got different questions for our preschool, school aged, and adolescent um, families. The P is what, a question that you might ask a parent, and the C is the question that you might actually ask a child. Um, it goes through these bedtime problems, excessive daytime sleepiness, so feeling fatigued or tired during the day. Um, also gets out awakenings during the night, so if they're waking up a lot during the night, having trouble um, getting back to sleep after they awaken, um, as well as the regularity of their sleep, and then also kind of a, a quick screening for sleep disordered breathing. So are they snoring or having a hard time breathing at night? And then lastly, just some of my favorite resources. Um, and I've split these out by, um, by kids and families and for providers. And I know you all have access to these slides. Um, so for kids and families, these are my, my common go-to recommendations. Um, the what to do when you do spread your bed on the left is the one, there's a really good section there about the bedtime pass that I was telling you all about that um, is highly, 
highly effective. Um, and then the sleepy puddle and other stories is a really nice guided imagery and progressive muscle relaxation book for, for families. Um, some other resources for more oriented towards parents specifically, babysleep.com was developed by the Pediatric Sleep Council. It has a number of experts weighing in on various issues sorted by age, condition, neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, it's really well done. And then for professionals, these are just among my favorite. Of, um, I keep close by me at all times, very digestible. This clinical guide to pediatric sleep, diagnosis management of sleep problems. Um, includes handouts that are very user friendly. They're meant to be printed out and given directly to the pa to the patients and families, um, and so it makes your job easy as a as a caregiver as a, a provider. Okay, references, and uh, if there's any time, I'm very happy to take to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cords. We do have about two minutes left, so if folks do have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat or the Q and A box, and we'll be happy to answer those. Um, in the meantime, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I will let everybody know that the next webinar in the series is on May 19th at 12 on managing autism in primary care. Dr. Cynthia Ellis will be presenting on that one. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that one. And then lastly, if you have any questions about today's webinar, you can email me at laura.holly at unmc.edu. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about the UNMC Telebehavioral Health Consultation Team, the website for that is also below. Um, and you can email Dr. Holly Roberts if you have questions about that. And with that, I'll see if we have any questions. I don't see questions right now. We'll give folks one more minute to think. In the meantime, thank you all for, for tuning in and listening. It's, it's been a pleasure.